Check, check, check. All right, we're ready to get started. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Lance. I'm one of the pastors here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. This is The Gathering. The Gathering is two worship services at 9.30 and 11 o'clock right here in Wesley Hall. At 9.30, this room is always packed, and so we have an additional overflow space, The Gathering Cafe up on the third floor. I'm glad you're here with us today. It's meant to be a place that's engaging and welcoming, comforting, a place to you, for you to connect with God and to each other. And so I'm just so thankful you're with us for worship. Uh, a couple announcements before we get going here today. Uh, the first announcement is we have an active group of folks in their 20s here at the church. We call them the Young Professionals. The Young Professionals do a lot, including uh, after the 930 service, they get together and walk over to Bongiorno and have coffee. They have game nights. They have a Bible study. And once a month, they get together for something called Pub Theology. It's a great entry point for people who are looking to make connections and friends. They'll meet together, have happy hour and a discussion about life and faith and what it is to be a young person, balancing all those things. The next one's tomorrow. They're always Monday nights at 630. So it's tomorrow at the food court at Crockett Row. Uh, if that applies to you, I hope you come. If you have someone in your life that's in their 20s, I hope you tell them about it. On the attendance card, if you want more information about any of the YoPro stuff, just write YoPro on the card and we'll get you connected uh, to one of their leaders and to all the information you need. Next announcement. Uh, we have a lot of things happening here at the church and a lot of people getting connected. Uh, so one of the ways to get connected is what we call Discover FUMC Coffee. It's going to be next Sunday after the 9.30 service, before the 11 o'clock service, uh, 10.30 in the library, which is just out these doors and across the hallway. It's a real casual come and go affair. Uh, it's a chance to meet some people, put some names and faces together, meet some ministry leaders. If you're one of the people who's just kicking the tires on faith or the church, it's a great uh, no pressure way to come and just make some connections and find out about next steps. The, uh, also, we, one of the ways we do joining here in the gathering is having everyone join together. Every month or two, we'll have a big group come together. Uh, and if someone hasn't been baptized, we'll baptize you. If you've been baptized in any Christian tradition, we'll honor and welcome that baptism and welcome you into being at this part of the church uh, through either transfer of membership or profession of faith. So if you're ready to make this, this church your home, uh, that's the next day that we're going to do it. It's on October 13th. If you're interested in joining or anything like that, just mark that interest on your card and we'll make sure to contact you. Uh, next announcement is another way to get connection, and particularly for those of you who have some theological questions, you want to know what it is to be a person of faith or to be a United Methodist and part of this tradition. Uh, we have pastries with the pastors uh, on October 20th, also at 930. So let us know you're interested in that. Write that on your card. Uh, a chance for you to have conversations and connect with people who can maybe answer some of your theological questions or your practical questions on what it is to become uh, a person of faith or a part of this community. We'd love to have that interaction with you. Uh, we also, uh, if you become a part of this church, one of the things that we're going to teach you and shape in you and mold you is, is how to have your life transformed by the grace of God. We're going to tell you the actual, concrete, tangible things you can do in your life uh, to help you become one of those people who feels the grace and presence of God in their life on a daily basis. Uh, and so the way that we do that is what we call healthy plate discipleship. And we introduce that to people with a breakfast. The next one is October 20th at 930. That's a chance to have an overview and an understanding of, uh, of the rhythm of life at this place and how we help people go from just maybe attending worship or just reading the scripture a little bit to actually have a, a transformative relationship with God. And so that's the Healthy Plate Discipleship Breakfast. Of course, all of these things are under the umbrella of helping you make sure that you have a home, that you have connection, that you have friends and relationships, and that you're growing in your faith in Christ. And so uh, I hope you'll take us up on any of those offers. Uh, finally, we have an act, a number of colleges and junior colleges in the area. Uh, we have a lot of college students who will come through and attend worship. I uh, just want to let you and everyone you know know that if you have a current college ID and you come up here, we'll, we'd, be, we'd love to give you breakfast. So show us your college ID uh, and we'll give you two breakfast tacos for free. If you're one of those people who's graduated college but keeps your college ID with you so you can get discounts on movies and things like that, don't do it here. That's stealing from Jesus, okay? <laughs> Save that for the movie theater, but don't. Uh, and then on Sundays, immediately after the 930 worship, we have beginning this Sunday for the college kids, a conversation up in room 350 in the Gathering Cafe with some of our facilitators, uh, some young, prof uh, young professionals from our community will, will have an interaction and a conversation with those college kids that's help them kind of wrestle with what it is to, to become a young adult and be out on your own and, and have faith and life all coming together at the first time. And so uh, if you or someone you love is in that age group uh, or maybe is in that age group but isn't attending school, please let them know that's a place for them to connect and, and we'd love to have you be a part of that ministry and community here at the church. So now, every time we come together, two things go in the baskets. The first is your attendance card. Uh, if it's your first time here, please let us know that you were here by filling out your attendance card. If it's your 100th time here, please do the same. If you're interested in any of those ministries or ways to get connected, you can indicate your interest on those cards. 
The second thing that goes in our baskets are our tithes and our offerings. That's money. That's the financial giving that supports worship, that supports youth ministry, children's ministry, mission and outreach, uh, all the musicians, the leaders, the teachers, all the stuff that happens here at the church. Uh, that's made possible by your giving and your support of the ministries of this church. And so one of the things that happens at every church is that during the summer, people kind of come and go a lot. Uh, that, and usually kind of giving is reflected in that. Uh, one of the things that happened here in the last couple months is that uh, giving income fell significantly below operating expenses. And so I want to speak to people, particularly those of you uh, who have made pledges to support the church financially over the course of this year. Please take a time and pause and, and, and make sure that you're current on those gifts and support. Uh, if you're not, now's a perfect time to catch up. I also want to speak to people who are a part of this church. Maybe, maybe you're really regularly, maybe just dipping your toes in, but you found in this place uh, a chance to connect with God, a chance to learn more, a chance to make friends and, and real relationships. And if you're one of those people and you haven't yet made the leap into living generously, to living sacrificially, uh, to giving back to God the first fruits of what's been given to you, then now's a great time to start. And so if you're one of those people that, that giving and supporting a church and the presence of the gospel in your life and other people's life, if that's on your someday maybe list, but it hasn't happened yet, uh, now's a great time to think more deeply about that as well. So uh, if you're one of the families like my family that gives online, uh, there's a little marker in your seat. If you'd please make sure to put that in the basket as it comes around. We do that, one, to show our children how we're support, uh, faithful in supporting the church. Uh, we also do it so together as a community we can see the faithfulness uh, of each other because so many of you are so faithful in your giving, and I want to thank you for that. So I'm going to go ahead and pass these baskets, and then I want to invite you to join together and stand as we read together our invocation. Standard church rules are going to apply. I'm going to read the leader portion, and together out loud, we will all read the bold in italics. Those who love God, God will deliver. Those who know God by name, God will protect. Those who call out to God, God will answer. We gather this morning as those who trust God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the gathering. Uh, my name is Savannah, and it's so good to be here with you this morning and um, join in worship together uh, with all our voices. It's, it's always such a beautiful thing. Um, we're going to start this morning with a song called Lord Have Mercy, so join us. When I come to you in prayer, Lord, have mercy. When I wonder if you're there, Lord, have mercy. When I cannot find the way, Lord, have mercy. Should my heart begin to stray, Lord, have mercy. together again. 
please take a seat. Good morning. My name is Jenya. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the church. And today I will lead you in the prayers of the people. Every single time when you come here on Sundays, we have this very precious time that are called prayers of the people. Why do we pray? Pray is the time when we open ourselves up for God's transformation, for God's grace, for God's love, for God's presence in our lives. This is those moments that are so precious because this is our way of being open, of listening to God and also speaking to God. During the prayer, I will invite you to say out loud the names of people who are in your heart today. Maybe somebody really, really needs right now God's presence to manifest itself in their life, for God's hand to just come and help them and encourage them and carry them through whatever storm it is that they're going through. Don't be shy. Pray for them. Say their names out loud. God listens to our prayers. Also, if you have somebody who is just going through a very blessed time in their lives and blessings are just pouring down on them and life is great, treasure those moments, say out loud their names with thanksgiving because God is so good and God's love and God's grace and God's presence in our life is so good when we see it, when we feel it, when we know for sure 100% that yes, God is right there with me and I feel that presence. Give thanks to God if this is you, if this is somebody who you know, give thanks to God, say their names out loud. During the prayer, a few times I will say, Lord, in your mercy, please join me and say, hear our prayers. Let's practice that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, you call us to trust you in every storm and in every trouble. And yet so often we lose that trust. In times of oppression, in times of problems, we lose hope in our future. When suffering illness, when we are facing death, we often grow bitter and we forget about your love, God. Stripped of all the idols of our wealth and our status and comfort and safety and protection, we try to still control our lives, but we fail. We want to be powerful, we want to be successful, and we wander away from you. Absorbed by our own needs, by our own desires, we are blind to those around us who need our care, who need our presence. For this God, please forgive us. Forgive our despair, forgive our bitterness, forgive our fear, forgive our doubts. Turn our hearts to you, God that we may taste the fullness of life that Jesus Christ taught about, and that we could trust in the promised salvation in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father God, the creator of all, your creation testifies about your love, about your power, about your grace, new lives, new hopes, new opportunities, renewed strength, renewed hope, renewed faith. For all of this, God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Everything, God, that you create, you make free. And over and over again, we abuse that freedom and we turn it into a sin. So for alienation from you, for violence, for hatred, for greed, for all of this, we ask for your forgiveness and you, God, forgive us and you never abandon us, even at our worst. You walk alongside us, you stand with us as Jesus Christ, who redeems us and reconciles us and brings us closer to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers always and everywhere god we are never alone because the holy spirit is with us shines the light on our path holy spirit brings us to the new experiences of your love and grace and for this constant presence oh god we give you thanks and we worship you and we praise you lord in your mercy hear our prayers we pray god for ezra and for trip lord in your mercy hear our prayers we pray for martin and for susan lord in your mercy hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers are there any others call their names out loud lord in your mercy hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers lord in your mercy hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers 
for all the names that we speak out loud and all the names that we keep close in our hearts, God, we pray and you in your mercy, you hear our prayers. We pray for people who are looking for you, who are looking for salvation, who are looking for strength and hope in you, God. For, for them we pray and you hear us. And God, we also pray for people who are struggling with the biggest storms in their lives, who are waiting for medical test results to come back, who are working on their relationships, who are repairing their families, God. For all of these people, we pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Amen. What it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see When your face is before me I can only imagine Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Only imagine when that day comes, when I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I would do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. by your glory what will my heart feel will i dance for you jesus or in of you be still will i stand in your presence or to my knees will i fall will i sing hallelujah will i be able to speak at all i can only
band for their leadership. I want to make sure to thank Allie in the back on all the technology. Uh, to thank all the volunteers who are so instrumental every single Sunday, from everything from brewing coffee to selling breakfast tacos to setting up the chairs, putting everything in them, teaching the youth, teaching the children, leading in Sunday school. Thanks to all of you who are so instrumental in making sure that this place uh, is a place where people can come to know God and know each other. Uh, I want to extend a word of welcome to all of you, a word of welcome in particular to those of you who've been heeding the call to uh, reach out to your friends and family, your neighbors, your co-workers, to put a little bit of your social capital on the line and say, hey, I found this place, I found this community, I found this opportunity to, to better understand God, to better understand faith, and, and something's happening in my life there, and I'd love for you to join me, I'll meet you there, I'd love for you to come along. Uh, for those of you who've been extending that invitation, thank you so much. For those of you who are on the other end of that invitation, for those of you who are stepping your toes in the water, uh, for those of you who may be outside of your comfort zone or maybe re-engaging for the first time in a long time uh, and coming to this place or any place for worship or to hear uh, the gospel or scripture or Christ or how that can play a role in your life, I want to make sure that you know that you're welcome here, you're safe here, you're loved here exactly as you are today. I'm so thankful for you, but I really want to send a special word of invitation and a special word of welcome to those of you who just barely crawled in the door today. <laughs> I want to welcome those of you who came in hurting, those of you who came in feeling stepped on or overlooked or hurt or hung over, or those of you who came in feeling hollowed out or less than, for those of you who walked in this place and saw everybody else and said, these people look too happy clappy, these people look too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed, and that's not me today. Uh, if you're one of those people who just barely walked through the doors today, I want you to know that this is a hospital, and it is a hospital here for you. Uh, this is exactly the place for you to be in this morning, and I'm so glad that you're in this community for worship together today. So, speaking of just barely crawled in the door today, I'm back, and I'm glad to be back. Thank you. For those of you who don't know what that means... For those of you who don't understand, uh, I'm one of the regular preachers here at the church. I, I speak in the gathering nine and a half times out of ten, but I've been on leave for the last two months. My family is in the process of adopting what feels like 75 children. <laughs> and I was on paternity leave for the last eight weeks. That leave ended this morning, and so I'm back, and, and we're excited to get into the swing of things. Uh, I cannot extend enough. I have to just say thank you so much to our friends and our family, and particularly our members of our church community. Uh, who were so incredibly generous to my family, generous with the gifts, uh, literally providing the beds, the car seats, the, the clothes, the diapers, the wipes, all the toys, the stuff that we would need. For those of you who showed up to babysit, who brought meals, who've been praying for us, making space for us, being generous and grace-filled towards us, we literally could not have done it without you. Uh, my wife and I have been talking about how overwhelming it is, and we've just learned a lot from you. We've learned a lot uh, from, from you guys how to show up for people, uh, how to kind of anticipate people's needs, how to witness to love and grace in other people's lives. And we're truly really overwhelmed. And I just I want to say that word of thanks before we get back to uh, regular participation. And a uh, special thanks to those who led the gathering, who, who guided the gathering uh, while I was gone. I can't express my gratitude enough. And it was, it was hard to be away. It, it was hard to be away for eight weeks. It was hard to be away for a number of reasons. One, to be honest, I'm kind of used to people sitting still and listening to me. And that didn't happen. That wasn't happening at all. I missed that. But it was particularly hard to be away because we're in the middle of a series about facing life's storms. And for those of you who have been regular participants in the gathering or will be, you know, one of the things that is just core to my understanding of who Christ is and what the good news is and what it means to be a Christian is to know that faith isn't something that just plays a role in our life on Sunday morning. It's not just something that we, we say every once in a while when we're in the middle of a hard time or a tough time or when we're really angry or upset. It's something that impacts every aspect of our lives. Uh, it changes how we understand ourselves and how we understand other people's and the purpose of our life and the struggles that we face. Faith and, and, and following Jesus and, and, and seeking a relationship with God is something that runs through every aspect of our lives, and particularly when things are tough, particularly when we're challenged, when we're upset, when we're struggling, when we're suffering. That, that faith is one of the most important parts of our lives, and so it was hard to be away. I really wanted to be back and be a part of this conversation. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. And um, just to kind of give an overview, just a reminder, we talked about this when I spoke about a month ago, but uh, particularly for those of you for whom Christianity is kind of a new thing, or, or, or maybe you've kind of, you feel like an overview would be helpful, just a reminder that Christianity is not about escaping the world. 
Some people kind of live into their faith in a way that makes it look like they believe to be a Christian is to be separate from everything and just waiting for heaven, right? To be not a part of life and to be disregarding most of it and trying to carve out a separate sphere for themselves. And that's not what it's like. Christianity, following Jesus, taking him seriously is about deep and meaningful living today. Who you are today, how you treat people today, how you understand yourself today. That is what faith and Christianity is all about. You know, a lot of times, particularly when we're young people, the way that faith is expressed to us uh, just seems like a long list of thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Uh, for a lot of people, all they've come to understand of what Christianity or faith is about is just a list of stuff you can't do, right? Don't do this, don't do that. Particularly if you like it or if it feels good, right? At the 930 service, my wife was the only one who laughed at that. <laughs> right, I wish she was here. Um, <laughs> It's more than that. Christianity is the why, the how-to for a rich and healthy soul, for a rich life and a healthy soul, right? It answers those questions. Who am I? How am I to live? That's what it's about. It's not just a long list of don't, don't, don't. And finally, and this is really important, Christianity is not a guarantee that nothing bad is going to happen. It's not a guarantee that nothing bad is going to happen. This, this sermon series, Facing Life Storms, this isn't me and Tim, the other the preacher, the senior pastor who's preaching in the sanctuary right now. It's not us being clever, this is Jesus' teaching to us, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. He says to us, those of you who hear these words of mine and put them into action will be like a wise builder who built his house, meaning his life, on the rock. And when the storms blow and the winds come and the waters rise, their life will still be intact, right? Not that if they come, but when they come. And those of you who, who hear my words or disregard me or don't take me seriously will be like the kind of people who build their house, their life, on sand. And when the inevitable storms come, their house, their life will collapse because it's not built on anything solid and worthwhile. How many people's faith and relationship with God and hope in Christ was dashed on the rocks because something terrible happened? And somehow they had come to tell themselves the story that being a person of faith, of, of being a Christian, of being a person of prayer and of worship meant that they were never going to lose anybody, that there would never be any setbacks, there would never be any struggles, nothing terrible was ever going to happen. And when it did, they said to themselves then, well, if this was true or if God was real or if I was really loved, then nothing bad would ever have happened. When the truth is, Jesus tells us this world is a fallible place and a difficult place. Stuff will happen. Difficulty will happen. Storms will come. And listening to me and living and abiding in my grace will be the foundation so that when they do, you can weather the storm. So we've been talking about a number of the different storms that hit us, the storms that come in our lives. And, and some of them uh, don't apply to all of us. And there's one of them that does, and that's losing somebody that we love, having someone that we love die. And in particular, that's a storm that we are all guaranteed to face. And before I get into it, I want to acknowledge that in this room today, that's a real live issue. That's not a hypothetical for a number of people. We've got people who are widowers and widows in this room. We have people who've lost their parents, people who've lost their children. We have survivors of suicide, survivors of accidents and tragedies. And so I just want to acknowledge this is a real thing in this room. And so in particular, I want to, I want to talk about the emotions that happen on those losses that weren't part of the plan. Right? Like, for example, uh, I have a grandmother, I have two grandmothers that are still alive, and uh, my mother's mother, is, we call her Dotsy, and the uh, Dotsy in three weeks is going to turn 100 years old. And so we can't wait to go celebrate October 26th, her 100th birthday. And Dotsy's in great shape, and she could easily live five or ten more years, but someday Dotsy's time is going to come, and Amidst, the, prayer, amidst the, the prayers and the songs and the tears, none of us is going to say, we just needed more time, right? We, we've had plenty of time. We understand uh, that God's been blessed with an amazing life, and someday it's going to come to an end. It's not going to have that same kind of loss. I want to talk in particular about the kind of losses that we're not prepared for, the ones that hit us and hurt us and scar us in ways that uh, can have aftershocks that last a long time. In 2007... I was living in Chicago, and I, was, uh, I, had, I had tried a corporate career for a brief period of time and discovered that khaki pants and cubicles were not for me, so I tried something else. And I was the manager of a little boutique wine store, and uh, it had closed at 10 o'clock, so I was closing up shop and uh, getting ready to go home, and uh, my dad calls. And it's like 10.30 on a, on a weekday night, and that's unusual. Dad doesn't call at 10.30 on weekday nights. Dad calls uh, on, during halftime of the Cowboy game. We have a routine. This is not when we're talking. And so dad calls, and so I pick it up, and he immediately has that voice, right? He has that tone of voice. 
Hey, Lance, I'm sorry to call. Weird time. Do you have minutes to talk? Yeah, Dad, of course. Lance, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. I, I don't know how to say it. Uh, there's been an accident. Billy Joe's dead. And uh, I have a really small family. We can have a family reunion in a kitchen. I don't have a big family. And I don't have a lot of cousins. don't have a lot of extended family. And uh, I do have, uh, my dad has a sister, a younger sister, my aunt. And my Aunt Terry had two boys, Billy Joe and Aaron. And as far as cousins who are your age, that's all I got. That's all I got. The, the cousins that are your age and you play together and you run around the yard together and you see each other at grandma's house and you share toys at Christmas and all that kind of stuff. That's all I got. Uh, I was in my early 20s. Uh, Billy Joe was about five years older and there was a car accident and, and he passed away. And uh, we found out over the, the, the coming weeks and months, um, there were toxicology reports. There was no drugs. There was no alcohol. Um, and there was actually a witness to the, the, the crash. It was one of those little East Texas highways. And it was a police officer who actually saw him and the truck before it happened. And he said, I saw him and he was dead before the crash. He was dead behind the wheel. And so there were, there were tests and uh, he definitely went, hadn't fallen asleep. It was the middle of the day. We didn't really get positives or negatives on aneurysms. We don't know what happened. In his late 20s, he was gone. He just, the life left him. He was gone. And so I remember uh, my dad's telling me this on the phone. We didn't have all those details yet. We just knew that he was gone. And uh, I was riding my bike home. I had about a five mile ride, about a 30 minute ride home that night and every night. And I remember kind of coming to, uh, I'd been riding my bike for about an hour. I was at a part of the city I'd never seen before. I was just so shocked and disoriented by what I had heard. I was just lost. Uh, get it on a plane, fly home to DFW, get rent a car, drive out to East Texas. 48 hours later, I'm at the funeral and I'm a pallbearer and I'm wearing a suit. It's the middle of the summer in East Texas, and it's 110 degrees and 100% humidity, and I'm wearing a suit in the middle of that, and I'm holding Billy Joe's casket with his body inside of it. And uh, I'm feeling the pain that goes beyond pain, and I'm feeling the hurt that goes beyond tears. And what I feel like is like my heart's been ripped out. That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that. I'm gonna talk about what happens then. The, uh, and, and some of my, my research and my prep uh, for this message, I came along this. Uh, Coeur is French for heart, apparently. I don't speak French. Um, Coeur is French for heart, and it's the root of the word discourage. Discourage means to have the heart torn out. Discour we use the word discourage, like, oh, I tried hard, it didn't really work out. I was a little discouraged. And discouraged means to have your heart torn out, to have a hole inside of you where your beating heart used to be. That's discouragement. I want to talk about that feeling. That's what I felt that day. I want to talk about when each of us in experiences that. And conversely, that same root is the root of the word encourage, which literally means to pour the heart back into. How can we receive encouragement where we in, in that place of having had our heart torn out? What can possibly encourage us then. So that's where we're going to be encountering our piece of scripture today. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. So for those of you who are uh, um, encountering this text for the first time, or maybe reading the Bible for the first time, there's a lot of different portions of the New Testament. We call them books, but a lot of them are letters. 1 Thessalonians is one of those letters. Uh, for those of you who are kind of like Bible fact nerds out there, 1 Thessalonians is the oldest surviving piece of uh, new Christian writing that we have. It's older than the Gospels. It's older chronologically than any other document in the New Testament. Uh, if you have one of the red CEB Bibles from the back, it's going to be on page 903. Uh, so this is our oldest document. It's written by a man named the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is someone who had an encounter with the risen Christ shortly after his crucifixion and his resurrection. Paul becomes the foremost leader and teacher and church planner in that new Christian movement. And one of the things that he did was travel to the city of Thessalonica and planted a church in that community. And he's keeping touch with them and with the other churches that he's founded. He's writing them letters back and forth. That's the real cutting edge technology that they have in their community. He's writing letters to, to encounter them and encourage them and address the issues that they're facing. And something that's happening in Thessalonica is that the community there is under siege. The community there are people who have to struggle and who are persecuted for their faith. And one of the things that started to happen in their community is that their beloved, the people that they care for, the people that they share life with, the people that face the struggles that they face, that they form intimate bonds of love and connection with, some of those people are starting to die, to pass away. And the people, those new generation of Christians, those first Christians were not prepared for that to happen. And the feeling is that of having their heart torn 
out. And there are so many pieces of the Bible that talk about life after death or things that we can expect come heaven. Uh, but this is the piece I really want us to focus on because it's written by a Christian leader and teacher to a community that is having their heart torn out to a community who is feeling exactly how I felt at that cemetery outside of Jacksonville a little bit of over 10 years ago. He's writing there, and what do they need to hear? And what do they need to know? And what do they need to let reside in their soul so they can begin to grieve and to better orient themselves into a way that will ultimately lead toward life and to healing? And so this is what we're going to be reading together today. Uh, I'm going to read it out loud. Um, at the conclusion of the reading together, we're all going to say, I'm going to say God speaks to us the reading of Scripture, and you're going to all say thanks be to God. So here are these words. Brothers and sisters, Paul says, we, meaning fellow apostles and teachers, we want you to know about people who have died so that you won't mourn like others who don't have any hope. We want to address this feeling of having your heart torn out by those that you love who have passed away. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose, so we also believe that God will bring with him those who have died in Jesus, meaning these people who had faith like you had faith, who were one with Christ like you were, those who died. What we are saying is a message from the Lord. It's aren't our message, it's Jesus's. We who are alive and still around at the Lord's coming definitely won't go ahead of those who have died. This is because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the signal of a shout by the head angel and a blast on God's trumpet. First, those who are dead in Christ will rise. Then, we who are living and still around will be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. That way, we will always be with the Lord. So encourage each other with these words. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. The audience of this message are baby Christians. They're brand new Christians, right? And so the majority of them, particularly those who are adults, will have been raised in another tradition with another understanding of themselves, the pagan community that surrounded them. And the community that surrounded them, their understanding of themselves uh, and of, of the supernatural or what else was going on in the world was so different than the Christian understanding. There was no part of their community or their surrounding people that had any inclination that any part of a person was holy or eternal or sacred. The community that surrounded them just lived with the understanding that everything was vapor, right? Nothing mattered, and there was no part of them that was of any eternal significance whatsoever. And when people were gone, they were gone, right? When suffering occurred, it didn't matter. Their ultimate conviction was that everything added up to nothing. That was the faith of the surrounding community. And so writing to their people, writing to their fellow Christians, writing to those that they loved who were so discouraged, Paul had to say, remember where this is ultimately headed. Right? Remember the story of what Christ is doing, has done, and will do. Remember where all of this ultimately goes because of who Christ is and what God has done in Christ. Nothing not suffering, not steps backward, and not even the grave will separate you from the love of God. This is not the end. So one of the things that will happen over and over again when we uh, experience a real loss when we experience real loss, people will try to comfort us. And so many people have a gift for that. So many people have a knack for that. This just natural ability to show up and to speak a healing word and a comforting word to people. A lot of people have that gift. A lot of other people, despite their best intentions, show up with this bumper sticker Christianity that just makes things worse. I talk to people who are grieving all the time. I talk to people who are suffering the loss of someone they love all the time, and every single one of them, it never fails, will say there was someone who said something to them, meaning the best, but said something like, well, this happened because God just needed another angel. Or this happened so that it could be a test of your faith and you could grow stronger. And they'll say something like that, meaning the best, and in doing so, so misrepresent the gospel and who God is and what God's about that it just makes people suffer more. Remember, God's ultimate purposes, the reason that all of creation was spoken into existence, the reason that you and me and everyone you love was given this amazing gift of life is for the purposes of relationship with God. That's what God is ultimately about. And because you can't force anyone or anything into relationship, God made you and me and all of creation free, free. And sometimes that freedom is used for purposes of destruction, illness, accidents, disease, 
or even death. When you lose someone in a tragic accident, when you lose someone for an unforeseen illness, when you lose someone that you love in a blink of an eye, it was not done by God because God needed another angel. It was not done by God to test your faith or make you stronger. People die because people got die. God does not make them die. God makes them live. And in the midst of loss and in the midst of hurt and in the midst of grief, God works for the purposes of reconciling and healing and restoring over and over and over again. And nothing, not even the grave, can separate them or us from the love of God. And that's not a platitude. That's not a panacea. That's an opportunity for you to live and grieve with the right orientation in mind. Because I got to tell you, all this being understood, we still grieve. Paul even says in that letter, grieve and mourn, but don't do so like the people without hope. Grieve their loss, grieve the tragedy, grieve the pain, but remember where this is ultimately headed. On a word on grief, um, grief was explained to me once by someone who was much smarter than me, but I can't remember who it was, so I'm just gonna take credit for this myself. They said, grief is like a button in a box. Grief is like a button in a box. And whenever that button is pressed, you are brought to your knees. Whenever that button is pressed, you feel the full weight of the, grease, the grief and the loss and the mourning and the pain. And inside that box, there is a ball. And that ball bounces around the box and it hits that button. And every time it hits it, you feel 100% the weight of that grief. And in the beginning, that ball fills almost the entire box and that button is hit every single day. And as we process healthily and as we mourn healthily and as we continue to root ourselves in a community of support and faith and hope, over time, that ball begins to shrink. It begins to shrink. And at one point it gets small enough where it doesn't hit the, the button every single day. But when it does, it's all back 100% again. And over and over, over time, that ball can get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where it might not hit that button for weeks or months. But when it does, triggered by a memory or a picture or a smell or a song, no matter how many years or decades it's been, it all comes back just like day one. That's what grief is like. But when we grieve, and when we mourn, and when we suffer the losses of those we love, we do so with hope, with the memory and the promises of Christ that tells us this is not the end. That's why it can still be called a good life. That's why God is still a God worth worshiping. And that's why this is a gospel worth living by, because this is not the end. If by any chance of your life, uh, you find yourself all of a sudden and with no preparation being a United Methodist pastor? <laughs> Look, it can happen to any of us. This is called the book of worship. This is the book that if you can just get your hands on this thing, it'll help you out. If you need to do a funeral, if you need to serve communion, uh, if you need to do a wedding, it will help you out and, and includes a lot of amazing resources. And I'm gonna close today with a prayer that's in this book. It's uh, a prayer um, specifically for being with a family. It's a prayer for being with a family uh, immediately after they've experienced one of these losses. Uh, the prayer is beautiful, and as is often the case, the, the words that are in here are so much more beautiful than any words that I can come up with. And so I want to close with this prayer today. And at the conclusion, we're going to pray uh, together the Lord's Prayer. So together as a community of faith, please pray with me. God of us all, we thank you for Christ's grace through which we pray to you in the darkest hours of our lives. A life we love has been or will be torn from us. Expectations the years once held have vanished. The mystery of death has stricken us. O oh God, you know the lives we live and the deaths we die, woven so strangely of purpose and of chance, of reason and of the irrational, of strength and of frailty, of happiness and of pain. Into your hands we commend the souls of those we love. No mortal lives have been made without eternal meaning. No earthly fate is beyond your redeeming. Through your grace that can do far more than we can think or imagine, fulfill in those we love your purposes that reach beyond time and death. Lead them from strength to strength and fit them for love and service in your kingdom. 
Into your hands also we commit our lives. You alone, God, make us to dwell in safety. Whom, finally, have we on earth or in heaven but you? Help us to know the measure of our days and how frail we are. Hold us in your keeping. Forgive us our sins. Save our minds from despair and our hearts from fear. And guard and guide us with your peace. All of this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, as together we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite forward our communion stewards to assist with the serving of communion today, I do so with a reminder, this is never the end of our worship service, it's its culmination. And it's a chance for us to taste, touch, feel, and know, maybe for the 100th time in our lives, or maybe for the first time ever, that Christ is with us, alongside us, at work in and through us now and every day of our lives. From the day he was to give himself up for us, Jesus had dinner with his best friends, his disciples, and knowing the losses and the grieving and mourning that would strike their lives and ours. He took an ordinary loaf of bread, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it and said, take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it and said, take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we drink it often, remembering that in the amazing times of joy and gratitude and in those times of unspeakable grieving, loss and mourning, Christ is with us now and forever. In just a moment, you're gonna come forward row by row down the center aisle and you'll go to one of the five stations up here with your hands held open like this. A piece of bread is gonna be torn off the loaf and placed in your hands. You're then gonna take that bread, dip it into the cup, eat it and return down the outside aisle for a time of silent prayer or for singing along with Savannah and the band. We always celebrate communion with non-alcoholic grape juice because we don't want anyone to ever have to choose between sobriety and the sacrament. We'll also have a gluten-free station off to the side for anybody who has a sensitivity to wheat. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is not the gatherings table. This is Christ's table. And like Christ's love, like Christ's grace, like Christ's promise of life eternal, it is for each and every person every age, every background, every understanding, it is for you here today. So whether you come here today from the mountaintop or one of those people who barely drag yourself in the door in the midst of grief and loss and pain, the table is set, the meal is ready. Come forward and be fed.
of it all I can never peer within Can never find the words I understand The fullness of a God Becomes the man Holy You, O oh God, are holy Trees clap their hands for you Oceans, they dance for you As we come to the end of our time of worship together today, uh, if you could please help pick up any of the pieces of paper, uh, the attendance cards or pens, we have baskets in the rear of the room, any cups, napkins, things along those lines, if you could please help us pick it up. This room gets used for a ton of ministry, uh, and that would be a huge blessing for everyone else who uses it. As we head out the door today, in the rear of the room, uh, Pastor Genia is going to be handing, holding this red basket in the back. If you're a first-time visitor or guest, she has a gift for you. Uh, she would love to get a chance to visit with you, hear your entire life story, tell you hers. Uh, and so she would love to do that. Please make sure to stop by and say hey to her. Don't do that. Don't. No rim shots. Um, we got to work it out. We have, we have a meeting after church. Um, <laughs> threw my groove off. Uh, please bow your heads and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And in the times of grief, loss, and pain, may you remember the promises of Christ and that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate anyone from his love now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.